I'm Walt, and this is Delta Astrophotography. Quite often people contact me on here or in my DMs on Instagram, and they just wanna know what kind of equipment that they need to buy to get into this hobby. And that's a really hard thing to answer because this journey is different from everybody. But I've decided to go ahead and make a top 10 list of things that you might wanna get for deep sky astrophotography. So we're just gonna be talking about deep space or deep sky astrophotography. So join us on today's episode of I Have No Idea! First things first, I'm gonna assume you already have the basics. You already have a camera and a lens and maybe even a little intervalometer or remote to control it without touching the camera. Those are the most fundamental basics of astrophotography and you need to get those first. Now, as for the list, it's gonna be different for everybody depending on what you might already have, where you might live, but I try to think of kind of a linear progression from starting out with astrophotography and what you might need as you advance farther and further. Like I said earlier, this is going to be a deep sky astrophotography list. I didn't make anything for Milky Way nightscapes and I probably won't for a while as, well, my Milky Way Canon 6D camera and my Tamron 24 to 70 lens was stolen recently. I was having it shipped back to me from Washington DC and somewhere in some post office, somebody opened up the box, took everything out, sealed the box back up and I got an empty box in the mail. So remember, always insure your packages, people. Anyway, a lot of things on this list aren't exactly cheap. Some are and don't be in a rush to buy everything. Just try to get them one at a time when you can. All right, now let's just go ahead and get on with it. And, and now, now number, number one, one, the mount. mount. The mount. mount. The key to astrophotography is long exposures. And if you've ever tried to do a long exposure with a telephoto lens or a telescope, you'll notice that the stars immediately start to stretch and trail just after like a second or so. This is why you need a tracking mount of some kind, like this small star tracker or this rather large and heavy EQ6R Pro Go 2 mount. For beginners, I usually recommend a small star trekker like the Ioptron Skyguider Pro, the Skywatcher Star Adventurer, or even the new Skywatcher Go 2 mount. I don't remember what that's called, but that actually has Go 2 functionality where you can make the telescope or lens point at any point in the sky automatically for you. Very nice feature, kind of like this bigger one does. But the, the old school manual star trackers are also great because it forces you to point your camera and lens at a target and you have to actually learn the sky and where things are. Some people find that frustrating. As a matter of fact, there are a few targets that would take me an hour or two just to find in the sky. So yeah, these can be frustrating, but very good to learn the sky. They're inexpensive. This is around the $400 range, whereas this is around the $2,000 range. This is designed for smaller lenses, you know, your wide angle lenses up to telephoto lenses that don't have that much weight. The maximum payload capacity of a star tracker is 11 pounds or about five kilograms. So it, yeah, it's meant for smaller stuff. This has a maximum payload capacity of about 44 pounds, or I think maybe 20 kilograms. So it's meant for big stuff and it's far more expensive. What these things do is essentially they follow the object you're photographing through the night sky. They move along with it so you can do long exposures without seeing those star trails. And longer exposures means you can set your ISO to a low, lower number and you're gonna get much cleaner images. This also allows you to take the photo over and over and over again throughout the night and stack the images to have an even cleaner image. You can even double or triple the amount of exposure time with a star tracker if you add something called an auto guider, which we will get to in just a few minutes. I'll leave a list of small star trackers trackers in the description below, as well as a link to this big go-to mount right here as well. And, and now, now, number two, two the, the telescope. telescope. When the average person hears the term deep sky astrophotography, they might think of a camera connected to a really huge telescope, but that's just not the case. If you're already a photographer and have some lenses lying around, some telephoto lenses like the 75 to 300 millimeter kit lens, or one of these big bird busting bastards, the Tamron 150 to 600 millimeter G2 lens, then you're good to go. But if you don't have any telephoto lenses and you're trying to get started, or if you're just wanting to upgrade and you're thinking, should I get a telephoto camera lens or should I get a telescope? I would absolutely 100% say, go with an apochromatic refractor telescope over a camera lens any day, 
Camera lenses aren't really made to take photographs of stars, tiny pinpoints of light. And one problem they have is that they don't focus the red light and the blue light together at the same time very well. And what you end up with is kind of a weird purplish blob around your stars. The cheaper the camera lens, the worse that is. And with some cheap telescopes, they have the same problem as well. And that's why I recommend a apochromatic refractor telescope because they correct that problem. All the colors in the stars will be focused at the same time and your stars will be small pinpoints of light. A lot of these telescopes require you to buy an additional flattener because apparently around the edges the stars will trail and the image is not totally flat. But I'm going to recommend a few apochromatic refractors that already either come with the flattener or don't need one. First is a William Optics Red Cat. Second is a Sharp Star 61. Third is the Radian 61 telescope, which is almost the exact same telescope as the Sharp Star 61, just almost double the price, but it comes with these really cool rings for attaching accessories. Compare the prices of those telescopes to a big telephoto lens like this, and you'll see why this is a much better option. They're just better for astrophotography and they're cheaper. And sure, you may not be getting autofocus or image stabilization, but you're not really gonna be using those for astrophotography anyway. And, and now, now number, number three, three auto, auto guider. guider. So we talked about using tracking mounts earlier to get your exposures longer, but we always want them even longer than that. And these tracking mounts do have errors in them. So they're not perfect, but we can make them a little more perfect by using something called auto guiding. This is an auto guider right here. It's essentially two parts. This back part right here is actually a camera. This is a guide camera by ZWO. It's the ASI 120MMS. And this is a 30 millimeter, yeah, ZWO 30F4 mini scope. Two parts. And basically I mount it to the top of my telescope or camera. And then I'll use a USB cable to connect this to a computer of some time, usually a laptop, but also there are um, some astronomy specific type computers that I will mention later. Yeah, if you run this into a laptop, you'll just run a free software called PHD2, and this thing is going to lock on to a star and it's going to keep it in place. If the mount starts to drift away from that star, this thing will send signals back to your mount and it will correct itself. An auto guider can mean the difference between a one minute exposure and a three to five minute exposure. That's incredible. I typically don't like to do five minute exposures because like if something bumps the tripod, that's five minutes gone that you don't get back. Whereas three minutes, uh, I'm a little more okay with that. Another reason I forgot to mention earlier about why I prefer using a telescope over a lens is that mounting an auto guider on a telescope is fairly easy. A lot of telescopes come with little mounts for guide scopes. Whereas with a camera and lens, it's a little more difficult. And I will make a full auto guiding tutorial in the future and I'll break down how to do all of that and how to mount uh, your guide scope and camera to your setup. And, and now, now number, number four, four, the, the ASI, ASI Air. Air. Once you get your auto guider, you're going to need a way to control it. If you have a laptop lying around the house, that's really all you need. Just download PHD2, it's a free software, and connect your auto guider to your PC and PHD2 will take care of the rest. You can also get some software like astrophotography tool that will control your camera and your telescope mount as well. But if you don't have a laptop or if you're just looking for something that's more streamlined just for astrophotography and it's super easy, then I recommend this. This is the ASI Air. This is my favorite, favorite, favorite thing of ever bought for astrophotography by far. This is essentially a little mini computer and it sends a Wi-Fi signal to your phone or tablet and all your astronomy gear plugs right into the four USB ports and you can control all of your gear with your phone or tablet. That's amazing. Let's just briefly go over some of the great stuff this thing can do. First of all, yes, you can plug your auto guider into this and it will take care of the auto guiding for you. You can also completely control and even automate your camera. You never have to touch your camera. You can do it all from your tablet or phone. If you have a go-to mount, it'll completely control it. As a matter of fact, the app now has a planetarium feature where you can look at a map of the sky at your time and location. Just tap on an object in the sky you want to photograph and your telescope will automatically point at it and if it's not perfectly centered, it will correct itself. Yeah. Now, if you just have a star tracker and you have to point your camera and telescope manually, then this thing will help you out with that too. It will look at your test shots, figure out where you're pointing in the sky and give you the coordinates. And you can use those to correct yourself. 
Here's a full video tutorial on how to use an ASI Air with a Star Trekker and find any target in the sky with ease. It can also help you polar align much more accurately or if you're somebody like ha that has bad knees and you don't feel like crouching down trying to look for a polar scope, the ASI Air will assist you in polar aligning your mount. It'll also control other accessories as well. For example, an autofocuser for your telescope, the cooling in an astronomy camera, and a filter wheel if you're using a monochrome camera and filters. Now there are a few drawbacks to the ASI Air. At the moment, it's really only compatible with Canon cameras, Nikon cameras, and of course, ZWO cameras. And if you plan on buying any accessories in the future, like I mentioned earlier, the autofocuser or filter wheel, they have to be ZWO accessories. Now for me, that's not a big problem. I actually like ZWO products, so I probably will be going with them in the future. But if you plan on using a large variety of cameras and accessories from all different makers, the ASI Air may not be for you. And, and now, now, number, number five, five, the light, light pollution, pollution filter. filter. Now, I live out in the middle of nowhere and have very few problems with light pollution, but most of you probably don't. You probably live in a town, a city, a suburban area, something like that, and have to deal with light pollution all the time. And not everybody has the time to just drive off into the country and whenever they want to shoot. So a light pollution filter is something you need to combat that light pollution. There are a few different kinds of light pollution filters. Um, there's broadband light pollution filters and then there's narrow band. Broadband will allow you to photograph more wavelengths of light, whereas narrow band really let, only lets in two or three wavelengths of light. So they're really great for photographing in the middle of huge cities. But for now, we're just going to talk about a regular broadband light pollution filter and the one I use is called the Optolong L Pro. The L Pro can come as a round screw-in filter that screws into your telescopes or like I have a clip-in filter. Now I have a combination of different lenses and telescopes and so I would rather have a clip-in filter so I can just move my camera from lens to telescope to lens to telescope and still use the same filter over and over. Clip-in filters are typically very easy to install, but it varies from camera to camera, so make sure you check out the directions, see if you can find some YouTube videos on somebody installing a light pollution filter in a camera like yours. I went with the Optolong L Pro because I've seen where a lot of other light pollution filters give a weird color cast, maybe like a purple color cast, and the L Pro does very little of that, and I can easily balance out the colors in Photoshop when I'm post-processing. It's a great filter for broadband targets like galaxies and nebulae, and not only does it reduce light pollution, it can also reduce the size of the stars if they get a little too bloated. So even if you don't live in a city, you still live out in the country or near the country, and you want to try a light pollution filter, this is really good for you because it'll just make the black sky even blacker and make your target pop out and make those stars just a little bit smaller. And, and now, now, number, number six, six, Astro, astro Modification. modification. Now it's time to get serious about astrophotography. The next step is astro modification. This is what I usually recommend before you start using narrowband filters. So basically what this does is there's a filter in front of your camera sensor that actually filters out a lot of red light. And unfortunately, a lot of the emission nebulae and uh, supernova remnants and things like that, they're full of that red hydrogen alpha light. And so we would send our cameras off basically and have them remove that filter and replace it with a different kind of filter or just remove it completely and have the sensor naked so we could pick up a lot more of that red light that's out there. Now I went with the website LifePixel and I got the hydrogen alpha modification. So basically they removed the sensor and replaced it with one that lets in hydrogen alpha light but still blocks out all the infrared because infrared can make your stars bloated. Now some people want infrared and want to be able to take photos in infrared so they get a full spectrum modification. That wasn't for me, I just got the hydrogen alpha modification. Also on these websites that do modifications, you can actually buy a camera that's also already been modified. So that's an option for you as well. But keep in mind, those are expensive and you're almost better off buying a dedicated astronomy camera at that point. Another thing to keep in mind, remember I said earlier about my camera being stolen? Yeah, when you're shipping your camera around, make sure it's insured because you don't wanna ship your camera and then when it gets shipped back, there's an empty box. Ensure that stuff. And, and now, now, number, number seven, seven, dual, dual narrowband narrow filters. filters. 
Once you have your camera Astro modified, then you can start using these narrow band filters. And the reason that I waited till after Astro modification is because they block out so much light, they actually only let in certain wavelengths such as hydrogen alpha and oxygen three. Now a stock camera does not do a very good job at picking up hydrogen alpha. So why would use one of these filters that only lets in hydrogen alpha when your camera does a pretty poor job of picking it up? That being said, some people like to try narrow band filters with stock cameras anyway, but I recommend doing this with a Astro modified camera. So like I said, these eliminate almost all wavelengths of light and only let in a certain few, hydrogen alpha and oxygen three. This allows you to photograph in a heavily light polluted city and photograph at nights when the moon is out. These also come in clip-in filters. I'm holding a two inch filter right now. It's in a little bag. I do not want to take it out of the bag and get fingerprints or dust on it. I wish I would have gone with the clip-in because now I can only screw this two inch filter in my Radian 61 telescope and I can't use it on any of my camera lenses. So that was a mistake. What I have here is the Optolong L Enhance filter. And this has allowed me to go out and shoot on nights where the moon is out. Now I haven't tried it under a full moon, but I've tried it under at least a 50 to 75% illuminated moon. And I got some pretty decent results because it only picks up a few certain wavelengths of light. It's not good on broadband targets such as galaxies and reflection nebulae. It's really good on emission nebulae and supernova remnants and things like that, that are just hydrogen alpha and oxygen three heavy. Optolong makes some versions of this filter that are even more extreme, such as the Optolong L Extreme and the L Ultimate that block out even more light. Another great advantage of narrowband filters, besides filtering out light pollution, is that they make your stars a little smaller. They're a lot less bloated. And so when you're shooting at very star heavy areas of the sky, it can kind of help clean things up. And of course, this is going to make the background sky darker and so your nebula or, or whatever you're photographing is actually going to pop out a whole lot more. If you plan on getting deep into astrophotography and you live in a big city, narrowband filters are the way to go for you. And, and now, now number, number eight, eight power, power solutions. solutions. So it's always important in astrophotography to get as many exposures as you can to stack and make your image look so much more detailed and cleaner. Problem is, with a lot of batteries and cameras, they don't last that long. And if you wanted to do a six hour session, there's just no way without having to change batteries, which could mess your framing up if you're using a star tracker or something like that. And I find that the best solution for me is a dummy battery. This is essentially a battery that goes in my camera has a cord coming out. With this on the end, I can plug this right into a wall and I can run my camera all night. Basically, I just take my camera, stick it in like it's a regular battery, and we are good to go. I don't have to worry about batteries anymore. Problem is, you're, you're not always at home or near some source of electricity. So, I ended up having to invest in this. Um, it wasn't cheap, but it's been well worth it because I can do astrophotography out in the field, camping, anywhere. And this is the Goal Zero Yeti 400. And of course, you could just plug your camera right into it like that, and uh, it would work fine. It also has some USB ports and uh, one more outlet over here so you can plug in a few more accessories. I've tested this thing out with my full rig, go-to mount, dew heaters, cameras, all that good stuff. And this thing can run my rig for about 12 hours. So that's great. I've been loving this. One problem though, this thing might not have quite enough outlets or USB ports to power all of your accessories. So we can get around that by getting one of these. Now mine has Velcro all over it, but this is the Pegasus Pocket Power Box Mini. And this is specifically designed to power all my Astro gear. It has four 12 volt outlets that can power things like my ASI Air and my mount. It has two RCA jacks that can power my dew heaters. It has an output just for your DSLR camera, and it also has a humidity sensor that can sense the humidity and the dew point and will turn your dew heaters on and off accordingly. So basically you can plug all of your astronomy gear into this one tiny little box and then take this one tiny little box plug it into either a power outlet near a house or a campsite or your portable traveling battery. And, and now, now, number nine, nine dew, dew heater. heater. 
The next one might be very important or not important at all, depending on where you live. It's a dew heater. Here in Mississippi, in the South United States, this, this whole area is like a swamp. It's very humid and in the middle of the summer and in the middle of the winter, my lenses and telescopes will fog up and get really wet after only 30 minutes of being outside. So I need a dew heater to warm them up. It's kind of like a defroster in your car. Now, if you live in the middle of the desert, you might not have this problem, but I know down here in the South, we definitely do. And so dew, dew heater straps are lifesavers. And I also put them around my guide scope as well. This particular dew heater strap, which as you can see is just like a Velcro, Velcro strap that wraps around your lens. It has a little RCA end here that plugs right into my Pegasus power box. Now, if you don't have a Pegasus power box, they also make dew heater straps that have a USB end that you can plug into any kind of USB power supply. So if you have extreme moisture or dew issues, definitely go get one of these. They're not expensive. Link in the description below. And now, number 10, Batonoff mask. And finally, the cheapest thing on our list is a Batonoff mask. This is a focusing aid. Basically, you slip it over your lens or telescope like this and this. And when you get your star in focus, it's gonna create diffraction spikes and it's, your star is gonna look like an X with a straight line right through the middle of it. So essentially what you do is you point your camera at a very bright star in the sky with the Batonoff mask on and take a test exposure in three to five seconds or something and adjust your focus until you can start to see a little X pattern. And there might be a line, but it's not directly through the middle. It might be somewhere off center. And you adjust your focus till the line is perfectly through the middle of the X. And then that is when you are in perfect focus. I've ruined a lot of photo shoots trying to focus on a star, trying to get it as small of a pinpoint as possible and shooting for maybe an hour or two and then trying to process the data only to realize I'm actually out of focus. A star can be difficult to focus on sometimes if the uh, seeing is kind of bad and everything's kind of warbly. These Betnoff masks are very cheap, somewhere between $12 and $20. I usually get mine on eBay or Farpoint Astro. Uh, a lot of reasons they're so cheap is because they're 3D printed and you can actually 3D print them yourselves if you have a 3D printer. All right, that wraps up our list. Let me know in the comments below where you're at in your astrophotography journey and what you think you might want to get next. I just recently noticed that I hit 10,000 subscribers. Holy crap, thank you guys so much. I never thought I would get this far. I'm just having fun talking about taking pictures of space. You guys have all been so great. And I guess to celebrate hitting 10,000 subscribers, my next video will be something a little different. We're gonna use astrophotography to debunk some conspiracy theories. If that sounds interesting to you and you're not already subscribed, definitely hit that subscribe button. And if you like this video, give me a like and a comment. Once again, you guys have been so great. Thank you so much for everything. As always, everybody, stay spacey, clear skies, and good night.